Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Grong Week in Review. This show was recorded on July 10, 2023. I'm Asbet Bedrosian. And this is Hovik Manucharyan. And here are the major topics we'll touch on today. We'll catch up on the latest developments in the Armenian-Azerbaijani negotiations, including a meeting of the U.S. and Armenian NSC advisors. We'll also discuss some of the results from a new MPG poll on the perception of people towards current events and the government. To talk about these issues, we have with us Benjamin Borosian, who is a senior fellow at Abri Armenia, a Yerevan-based think tank, and he's also the chairman of the Center for Political and Economic Strategic Studies. Hello and welcome, Benjamin. We're very happy to have you with us. Welcome, Benjamin. Hello, Hovik. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, I guess we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Armenia-Azerbaijan negotiations. There was hardly any progress reported by any of the two sides two weeks ago in Washington, D.C. Since then, we've learned that a month ago in June, Artsakh authorities have rejected a U.S. invitation to hold baku Stepanager dialogue in Washington. Now, the agenda for this so-called dialogue was evident in Ambassador Kristina Queen's comments on Armenian public TV that Artsakh sees could live under Azeri rule. Stepan Aged criticized her for appeasing the oppressor and predetermining the outcome of the talks. Now, Kavin tried to explain her words, but a lot of damage has been done to her political capital. Benjamin, given the current circumstances, what are the available options for the authorities in Stepan Aged? Okay, a very complicated and tough question. And I'm not sure that, frankly speaking, there are many or even any good option for authorities in but let's uh, start from negotiations. As far as I understand the situation, in the United States, uh, the teams, I mean teams of Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers, they work on a concrete document. Uh, we may call it uh, the peace agreement or agreement of restoration relations or normalization of relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But at least there is a text. I'm not sure how this text come about, Maybe the text is a mix of Armenian and Azerbaijani thoughts or ideas, but at least there is a concrete work on concrete text. Like, okay, let's discuss sentence number one. Let's agree on sentence number one. Let's move to sentence number two or article number two. Let's discuss wording, language, and etc. So this work is being done. But also, as far as I understand, uh, still there are three areas where Armenian and Azerbaijan are not able to find a common ground. Area number one, uh, the idea is that uh, before starting the limitation and demarcation process, Armenia and Azerbaijan should agree in principle on maps, which maps are going to be used for the limitation and demarcation. So Armenian government believes that the maps of 1975, uh, Soviet Union Armed Forces General Staff map, or maps of 1975, should be used uh, as a base for delimitation and demarcation. But the uh, issue here is not even the maps, like it should be 1975 map, I don't know, 1981 map or 1967 map. The problem is that, as far as I understand, Azerbaijan rejects this in principle. Azerbaijan says, no, we should not agree in principle on maps to be able to start the limitation and demarcation process. What Azerbaijan offers, let's start the limitation and demarcation process without any maps, and during this process, we will discuss also what maps should be used for this process. And as far as I understand, the international actors involved here, they are a little bit surprised, telling that, okay, but uh, it's very difficult to start the limitation and demarcation process without first agreeing on maps, at least in principle. Of course, after even agreeing on maps during the delimitation and especially demarcation process, there can be some changes and the process itself could take decades. But at least to start, you should have some basic understanding on what, based on what document, are you going to proceed? Right. However, I, I mean, the lack of maps is... kind of tells me that Azerbaijan is trying to make it so that the current status, the line of contact between Armenia and Azerbaijan, becomes the de facto border and turns into the Euro border. Well, uh, most probably, yes. And I will say even more. Azerbaijan thinks that as far as its army is stronger than Armenia one, he can take even more territories because if the limitation and demarcation process starts without any maps, then every moment you can escalate, then blame Armenia for escalation or telling that Armenia provoked us and we answered. 
and to take more territories. Then in the case, so uh, there is uh, this issue where Armenia believes that at least some map should be agreed as a base before starting the limitation and demarcation process, while Azerbaijan believes that, sorry, no maps should be agreed and we can start the limitation and demarcation process without any maps. And let's discuss the issue of maps during the process itself, uh, which itself is a strange position, but uh, we have what we have. However, even this issue is not the most problematic one. The most problematic one is that after recognizing Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan, and dropping demand even for autonomy for Nagorno-Karabakh, at least trying to bring back situation of 1988, when there was an autonomous Nagorno-Karabakh region within Soviet Azerbaijan. But current Armenian government at least now demands that first there should be some international mechanism or some international involvement for Nagorno-Karabakh-Azerbaijan talks, and talks should be focused on the right and security of Armenians, and second, that some form of international presence should be in Nagorno-Karabakh again to secure the rights of Armenians. Of course, there is a lack of clarity what Armenian government understands under this international mechanism or international involvement in negotiations and what Armenian government understands under the term of international presence. But still, these are two demands uh, which uh, Armenian government put forward. While these are being categorically rejected by Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan is clearly stating that this is double red line for Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan will never agree for any international involvement in any negotiations between, as they are telling, Azerbaijani government and ethnic Armenian minority in Azerbaijan. And second, that Azerbaijan will never agree on any international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. Okay, now there is an international presence, let's not forget, because Russian peacekeepers are also international presence. But what Correct. Azerbaijan is telling that Okay, guys, we will do everything to push out Russians after November 2025. And we will do everything, not allow anyone to come in. So these are uh, two very contentious points. And uh, frankly speaking, it's very difficult to assess. Uh, will anybody, I mean international actors, are they willing? Or uh, do they have capacity and capability to force Azerbaijan to change its mindset? Like to agree to international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh or agree that in principle there should be some mutual understanding about what map is going to be used for the process of delimitation and demarcation. Are they are they able, is anyone able to force Azerbaijan or is anyone willing? Tough question to answer. Right. I'm afraid not many. But then uh, the second issue rises, okay, let's assume that also Armenian government is telling that, okay, guys, I made two painful concessions very tough decisions, recognizing Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan, but I'm not going now to drop my demand of this international presence or international mechanism for negotiation between Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. But then, if you will speak with Azerbaijani experts, they are telling that this is even better for Azerbaijan if there will be no peace agreement. And uh, what is the explanation? They are telling, okay, guys, I'm speaking from their perspective. From their perspective, the uh, Karabakh issue is solved, regardless there will be peace agreement or there will be no peace agreement. They say now it's not the question of if, the question is when this game will be finished. But they believe that if there will be no peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it means that if there is no peace, they we have war. There will be no start of the limitation and demarcation process. And they say, okay, guys, now we are even more stronger than you than, for example, in September 2020, before the 44-day war. So, if we were able to destroy you in 2020 war, and now we are much more stronger, then if there is no peace agreement, we can simply put military pressure and take more and more territories from you, like we did in uh, Black Lake, then near Salt, then I don't know, in uh, September 2022, near Jerbuk. Uh, so, Azerbaijani mindset is this like, okay, guys, you are signing peace agreement very well. The peace agreement should be based on our terms, which means that. You have to say goodbye to Nagorno-Karabakh. Okay, you are not signing peace agreement. Again, you we will force you to say goodbye to Nagorno-Karabakh, but also we will attack you and take more and more territories. So it sounds like the jungle rules apply here. Yeah, it's something like uh, we have to accept that maybe Mr. Borrell was right when he said that Europe is garden and outside Europe is jungle. Okay, I'm not pretty sure that, for example, Canada and the United States uh, believe that they live in jungle, but let's leave Canada and the United States with their own problems. But in our part of the world, yes, and it's a really tough situation. Plus, 
Azerbaijani government is very clear that okay, if you are not going to dissolve Nagorno Karabakh Defense Army, uh, we will attack. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that everyone speaks about that. For example, you can check Armenian media expert community. You know that every day maybe we have 25, 30 interviews on traditional TV, internet TV, on different YouTube channels, and all 99% of speakers from Armenia, politicians, experts, they are telling that yes, Azerbaijan prepares ground to take Nagorno Karabakh, to take Nagorno Karabakh Defense Army. Okay, very well, but then what? Simply to state that okay, Azerbaijan is going to attack and then wait when this attack will occur, maybe not the best strategy. Yeah, well, so you mentioned that they have very limited options, and in fact, pretty much the only thing that is standing in the way of Azerbaijan attacking are the Russian peacekeepers. Why did Pashinyan call Putin on Constitution Day, July 5th, reportedly on Artsakh President Arai Karutinian's request? What did they talk about? Okay, I may only guess, frankly speaking, we know that also some letter was sent to President Putin by Arai Karutinian. I believe a day or two days are two days are, are there. Probably Karabakh army is trying to understand, okay, what Russian peacekeepers will do if Azerbaijan launches this large-scale attack against Nagorno-Karabakh Defense Army. Because uh, Azerbaijan has a few options. First, he can continue this surgical attack, the attack which Azerbaijan launched on early morning of June 28, killing four soldiers. They can do this, but they can simultaneously launch a large-scale attack, trying to destroy as much as possible of uh, Defense Army capacities, capabilities, and also maybe to launch some special operations trying to penetrate Stepanakert or other cities. So if Azerbaijan is going to have the second option, then okay, what Russian peacekeepers are going to do? Are they ready to fight back Azerbaijani soldiers and die? Because this will be direct combat, and definitely Russians will also suffer casualties. But also, is Azerbaijan ready to kill Russian soldiers? We all understand that after one, almost one and a half year war in Ukraine, uh, many in the world, including in the post-Soviet space, believe that uh, Russia as a state and Russian army as a military unit is not as strong as everybody uh, was thinking it was. And definitely this makes Azerbaijan uglier. But uh, does it means that Azerbaijan feels that Russia is so weak that he is ready to kill Russian soldiers? Or Azerbaijan seeing that he can make a deal with Russia, telling that, okay, guys, I'm going to launch large-scale operation. Please redeploy all Russian peacekeepers in their base in Stepanakert airport and allow us to do with Nagorno-Karabakh Defense Army what we want and we guarantee that no Russian soldier will be killed. The problem is we don't know what Azerbaijan speaks with Russia, what Russia thinks, but in general, I believe one thing is clear. If there would be no Russian peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh, this attack definitely would take place much earlier than now when we are speaking in perspective. Benjamin, Azerbaijan, as you stated, is basically showing a very callous, aggressive stance against anyone when it comes to their perceived interests. If a mediator shows even 10% of the pro-Armenianism that the U.S. has recently shown in pro-Azerbaijani one-sidedism, Azerbaijan would have walked out of the negotiations. A witness here how much ruckus they're making about France, for instance, being pro-Armenian even as France explicitly says that they will not come to Armenia's military aid in case of Azeri attacks. Uh, so, I mean, there are more examples. The U.S., for instance, welcomed Azerbaijan's threat-laden speech that included the possibility of amnesty uh, if only Armenians beg hard enough. And EU Toivo Klar, in fact, yesterday, when gas was temporarily enabled, he applauded Azerbaijan uh, and used that opportunity to call Stepan Akert as Han Kendi, in quotes. And then hours later, once the gas was turned off again, as if basic Azerbaijan is taunting and playing around with, with Artsakh Armenians, he offered like the usual regrets and concerns and heartfelt worries, but nothing else. So we talked about this with negotiations expert Arthur Martirosian last time. And I know there is such a thing as a best alternative to a negotiated solution. But in any case, how is it that the Pashinyan regime continues to negotiate with mediators who are reportedly pressuring Armenia itself into concessions, if only indirectly by appeasing the aggressor, by underwriting a negotiations process that is conducted with the help of military force whenever Azerbaijan sees the need for that. How is Armenia accepting this process as something that will lead to this elusive peace that Pashinyan is dreaming about? Okay, my understanding is that our government is somewhere in deadlock because they spoke too much about 
about peace, about peace agenda. I don't know, maybe really they believe that only salvation of Armenia is to normalize relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey. And because this is the only way to save Armenia or maybe even part of Armenia, then Armenia should be ready to pay any price. I don't know, maybe there is also this thinking that, okay, guys, we have to save Armenia and uh, we have to pay any price, which maybe from their perspective will save Armenia. Of course, all these are very debatable. First, what does it mean to uh, save Armenia? Or is it possible to save Armenia if we will completely lost Nagorno-Karabakh? And what I mean on the lost of Nagorno-Karabakh is that there will be less than 20,000 people there with Azerbaijani passports. Even if these uh, several thousand people will not be killed by Azerbaijan while uh, being used as a showcase for international community, it will mean that uh, the Karabakh issue, as we knew it, is solved. Okay, I'm absolutely not sure that after that, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey will uh, uh, allow Armenia to breathe because at the end of the day, let's not forget that at least if we speak from Turkey's perspective, in South Caucasus, the vision is very clear. Uh, Russia should have as less influence in South Caucasus as possible. Turkey should have as more influence in South Caucasus as possible. And of course, the key here is Armenia because at the end of the day, Russia projects its power in South Caucasus so also its military deployments in Armenia and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. So Turkey's position is very clear. Russians out of South Caucasus, Russians out of Armenia. And then, okay, what may, have, uh, what may uh, happen with Armenia? Uh, probably Armenia will uh, gradually transform into another client state of Turkey or will be put on the Turkish protectorate or patronage or client state. At the end of the day, as yes, uh, some Azerbaijan experts are telling, they are telling, okay, Armenia is a client state of Russia for the last 32 years. This is their understanding. So Armenians are used to be a client state. So what is the problem? Uh, you were a client state of Russia for 32 years. Why you cannot be client state of Azerbaijan for another 32 years? So what Russia gave you? Russia gave you cheap gas. We will give you even cheaper gas. Russia gave you investments, money. Azerbaijan and Turkey can give you even more money. We can pour more money into our Armenian economy. Azerbaijani and uh, Turkish tourists will visit Yerevan. They will eat in uh, restaurants, they will lose taxes, they will tip Armenians, every Armenian will be happy, so what's the problem? From Azerbaijani perspective, uh, they say we don't understand why Armenia cannot be client state of Azerbaijan if Armenia was client state of Russia for the last 32 years. Of course, it sounds, frankly speaking, very rude and insulting, but I'm trying to convey the way of thinking in Azerbaijan, how they perceive Armenia. So the perceive Armenia is a, such a weak state, which simply can uh, change its Patrons, okay. 30 years your patron was uh, Russia. Now Azerbaijan can be your patron. Maybe uh, 30 years after, I don't know, France can be your patron. So this is Azerbaijani thinking, and unfortunately, this uh, does not give us uh, many way for maneuvering or flexibility. Especially if Azerbaijan clearly states that okay, any moment I can use the force, and even our external partners, who, as far as I understand, are telling that okay, we don't want to see at least European partners. We don't want to see. Karabakh without Armenians. We don't want to be a part of the protest which will result into the situation when there will be no Armenians in Karabakh. We really does not want this. Why? Because we do not want to see a situation when uh, someone will put finger on us, point finger on us and say, okay, you supported de facto ethnic cleansing. No, they are telling we don't want this, but simultaneously they are telling that, okay, we are not in a position to stop Azerbaijan to do whatever it wants. And then you ask why? Answer is very clear. President Aliyev has very good friends in Brussels and in some individual European countries. And we all know that any strategic foreign policy decision in the EU is made by the principle of uh, unanimity, consensus. 27 member states should agree. And Europeans are very clear, telling that, okay, guys, definitely there will be at least few countries which will veto any sanctions against Azerbaijan, which will veto even any talk about sanctions against Azerbaijan. So, sorry, guys, we understand you. We understand that, okay, yes, Armenia should live in Nagorno-Karabakh. This is a homeland, several thousand years of culture, Christian culture, etc., etc. But sorry, we are not in a position to stop Azerbaijan. So you should go and find solution by yourself. Benjamin, that's a good question and a segue into the next question that I wanted to ask. If global powers don't want to see the Armenians gone, I mean, I understand I don't want to appeal to their pity, but aren't they also afraid of Turkey and Azerbaijan and this general like pan-Turanic alliance becoming too strong to influence them in the future? 
you know, we talked about France generally not being able to help Armenia militarily, or if there is any aid, we don't know if this is significant enough to change the balance of power. But also this week, Alain Simonian announced that Armenia was denied military aid from a special fund available for boosting EU partners' defense capacity. So it seems like even for funds that are meant to be used for this purpose, Armenia is not being allocated anything. And I want to understand how the EU, uh, we know that probably for the US is more of a zero-sum game in the conflict with Russia, but how does the EU see the regional balance of power and wouldn't the EU be more willing to help Armenia militarily? Or can we unequivocally say that the collective West, whether that's NATO, whether that's EU, whether that's US, UK, essentially are, are unwilling to provide military aid to Armenia anytime soon? That would be significant enough to make a, make a difference, essentially. First, regarding the differences between EU and the US position, my understanding is that yes, if US says, okay, we should do everything to kick out Russia from South Caucasus, and frankly speaking, we don't care about implications NATO on Armenia or Azerbaijan or Georgia on strategic level. If Russia out from South Caucasus, we are happy. If someone will suffer, the standard American way, nothing personal, it's only business. While EU still believes that, okay, most probably Russia will remain in South Caucasus, Russia is not going to leave South Caucasus, and even there is no need for EU to fight against Russia to kick out Russia from South Caucasus. And uh, as far as I understand, Europeans believe that any solution which will be against Russia's interest in South Caucasus, regardless if it's on Nagorno-Karabakh or Abkhazia or South Ossetia, this solution is cannot provide a long-term stability. Uh, which, by the way, is, uh, potentially opens uh, some sort of uh, Russia-Europe understanding, of course. Uh, given the war in Ukraine, maybe this sounds strange, Russia-Europe understanding. But I believe that at the end of the day, if Europe understands that, okay, Russia always will be in South Caucasus, and also they don't want to be associated with anything which may result in ethnic cleansing, even it will be soft ethnic cleansing, like migration of Armenians from Azerbaijan to Armenia for whatever reasons. But Azerbaijan is telling that I will never agree to any international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh, while still we have international presence in face of Russian peacekeepers, then in theory, if the options in Karabakh is Russian peacekeepers are leaving and Armenians are leaving, and Russian peacekeepers are remaining in Karabakh beyond November 2025, allowing uh, Armenian people to stay in Nagorno-Karabakh despite suffering under this terrible humanitarian crisis and the blockade, etc., but still remain in Nagorno-Karabakh, then I don't exclude that at the end of the day, Europe and Russia will come to an understanding that, okay, as far as this global turmoil continues, Let's keep Russian peacekeepers in Karabakh also beyond 2025. Because one thing is very clear. Benjamin, do you mean that they would give Russia UN mandate for that no, presence? No, no. There, there, there should be no UN mandate. This is absolutely exclusive. No UN Security Council mandate. I'm just telling that probably it could be some tacit understanding between Europe and Russia that at least Europe will not support Azerbaijani desire to kick out Russian peacekeepers beyond November 2025. Understood. Uh, of course, no UN Security Council uh, decision is possible to give any Russian troops a peacekeeping mandate in any part of the world, including Nagorno-Karabakh. But at least EU can somehow accept this status quo. Or even if theoretically the Russian and Azerbaijan can come to some bilateral agreement to extend the Russian peacekeepers' mandate, at least EU uh, can, after making some public statements that no, of course we are against, but in reality, maybe EU will not fight this back because. Again, if Europeans really, if they are sincere, that they don't want to see Karabakh without Armenians, and they don't want to be associated with any process which will result to the situation of Karabakh without Armenians, then again, let's be very clear, Azerbaijan will never allow any international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. And if Azerbaijan against this, the only way to put international peacekeeping in Azerbaijan without agreement of Azerbaijani government, the only way is UN Security Council resolution. But because UN Security Council is uh, dysfunctional due to war in Ukraine or in general due to Russia-West war, then there will be no UN Security Council resolution. And if there is a no UN Security Council resolution, no one else can force Azerbaijan to accept foreign troops on its soil. So to be very frank, either there will be no international presence in Karabakh beyond November 2025, or there will be Russian peacekeepers in Karabakh beyond November 2025. And again, if Europe is sincere in its intentions or its stated visions that, okay, we are absolutely against and any solution which result in ethnic cleansing is 
absolutely unacceptable for the European Union. But simultaneously, European Union is telling that, sorry, we cannot force Azerbaijan to accept international presence. We cannot force Azerbaijan because we all understand very well that the only way to force Azerbaijan to do something is to threaten President Aliyev family with personal sanctions. Because we all know that President Aliyev has tens of billions of dollars of money. And definitely, this wealth is not in Chinese banks. I don't believe this the wealth is in Russian banks. This wealth is in Western banks, in Western stock exchange, in Western luxury, real estate, and etc. But the problem is that uh, any even talk on sanctions requires uh, a unanimous uh, agreement of all 27 members of European Union. While, unfortunately, maybe for us, President Aliyev has several very good friends in several European capitals, and they will simply stop, not sanctions, even discussions about sanctions. So if EU is not able to force Azerbaijan to do anything, but also EU does not want to see ethnic cleansing in Nagorno-Karabakh, then the only way is at least not to support Azerbaijan to kick out Russians. So, so Benjamin, besides this per- personal friendship between Aliyev and EU leaders, how can we explain the the lack of desire to help Armenia substantially improve militarily uh, as a balance against Azerbaijan and Turkey? Maybe just enough to see that Armenia can keep Artsakh Armenian. Why is there so little appetite for EU countries to act outside of this uh, zero-sum game that the U.S. is playing with Russia? And is that or is that perception correct first, in the first place? And if it is, then is it wise for essentially Armenian analysts? There are some analysts who uh, present themselves as uh, you know NATO allied analysts or Western educated analysts or whatever that keep talking about this coming uh, huge uh, you know aid that EU will provide Armenia and the West will provide Armenia once Armenia gets rid of the Russians. Oh, okay. If you speak about EU as an organization. I believe in 2022, EU established this European Peace Initiative, which primary or sole goal to uh, send the military support to Ukraine. Of course, it sounds a little bit strange that it's called Peace Initiative while it's sending weapons to the country which is in war. But in any case, uh, as far as I understand, the primary obstacle for Armenia to be discussed as a candidacy which can receive uh, weapons from this European Peace Initiative, which, by the way, probably is going to be renamed as a Ukraine Defense Initiative or something like that. Uh, the primary obstacle is, first, Armenia CSTO membership, primary obstacle, uh, because some European countries are telling, okay, guys, this fund was established to support Ukraine, to fight against Russia, to make war against Russia, to defeat Russia. So how is it possible that the same, the, the same money which are envisaged to fight war against Russia and to defeat Russia can be spent to arm collective security treaty organization member and Russian ally. Uh, of course, uh, maybe someone will uh, say, okay, let's leave CSTO and then we can re- receive the weapons. But the problem is this is not even the clear cut. Like, yes, this is uh, Armenia CSTO membership is obstacle, but also no one is telling us that, okay, guys, if you leave CSTO, tomorrow this European Peace Initiative will be open for you for Billions of billions of euros, because again, sending real cutting edge weapons to Armenia it definitely means to act against Azerbaijan interests. So, a formal reason is Armenia CSTO membership and strategic alliance with Russia. But again, I don't believe that even if tomorrow Armenia will repeal its 1997 this uh, agreement with Russia and will start the process of withdrawal from CSTO, the next day this uh, European Peace Initiative will be open for Armenia. This past week, following the summit between Ararat Mirzoyan and Jehun Bayramov, the U.S. and Armenian NSC chairs, Jack Sullivan and Armen Grigorian, met in Washington. Reportedly, they discussed what's called the security situation and challenges in the region and the wider region and bilateral relations. Probably by quote-unquote wider region, they mean the Ukraine theater. And we also know that James O'Brien, the U.S. official coordinating sanctions on Russia, was in Armenia. Can you unpack this for us? What did the NSC chairs talk about? Mirzoen was there just a week before and met Sullivan. Why so many back-to-back meetings? Uh, okay, uh, I'm not aware of what uh, these guys were speaking with each other, but for, as I understand, the yeah, so U.S. strategic design in South Caucasus is first Armenia-Azerbaijan normalization, then immediately Armenia-Turkey normalization, then after Armenia-Azerbaijan, Armenia-Turkey normalization, 
the start of Armenia's withdrawal from CSTO, then potentially from Eurasian Economic Union, withdrawal of Russian fiscal experts first from Nagorno-Karabakh, and then to raise the question, okay, if you have a normal relation with Azerbaijan and Turkey, then what the hell do you need Russian troops in Armenia? Let's also kick out Russian military base from Gyumri. Okay, this is my understanding of U.S. strategic design, that the strategic goal is to decrease Russian influence everywhere, at least Biden and uh, Biden administration goal. Uh, maybe if in November 2024, a Republican candidate would win, either Trump or this Florida governor, maybe something would be changed. But as far as uh, Biden is in the White House, the U.S. foreign policy towards Russia is very clear. We can Russian position everywhere where it is possible, starting from probably like former Soviet space, including South Caucasus, this Africa, Wagner Group, and all other issues. I believe also, of course, Armenia understands that if there is no Russian troops in Armenia, then okay, who is going to stop Turkey? Uh, maybe some discussions were going on, okay, what type of guarantees can the US can give us? If it's only oral guarantees on statements, like statements which we hear every April 24, then it will be complete madness uh, to go and uh, sign uh, peace agreement with Azerbaijan, uh, then normalized relation with Turkey, then uh, demand Russian withdrawal of troops from Armenia, and then hope that Turkey or Azerbaijan will not occupy Armenia very quickly. So I don't exclude that uh, there were some discussions about this grand American strategy and how uh, Armenian Gregorian or at least Pashinyan government or top leadership of Armenian government believes where it could be. Hmm. You mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, this peace agreement to the letter is not ready for signing. This is also what Pashinyan had announced about a week ago. Would the gaps in the peace agreement be something that is being discussed at the NSC level, or do you believe that the visit was related more to bilateral relations between the U.S. and Armenia? Definitely. I believe uh, regional questions should be discussed, but also on bilateral level. For example, now we see how the United States would like to take part in the construction of these new nuclear power plants. And while the Russians are offering quite strong reactor, 1,200 megawatt, I believe. Uh, then uh, Americans, for example, offering uh, the so-called uh, modular uh, nuclear reactors. So it also on bilateral relations, efforts to somehow increase Armenia's energy independence or decrease dependence on Russia. But overall, U.S., strategy, at least Biden administration strategy, is to decrease as much as possible Russia's influence in South Caucasus. And frankly speaking, I don't believe that behind this strategy, and here why Armenia is important, because again, Armenia is a place which allows Russia to project power in South Caucasus. Mm -hmm. But frankly speaking, I don't believe that if uh, Russia will be kicked out from Armenia, then Armenia will have some particular interest for the United States. Azerbaijan will have. Let's not forget that Azerbaijan has several hundred kilometers of land border with Iran. There is a tens of millions of other speaking population in Iran, plus Israel and Azerbaijan are strategic partners, while Israel is a strategic ally of the U.S., and we all know how much influence Israel has in U.S. foreign policy. So from all perspectives, Azerbaijan is a much more important country for the United States and Armenia. Armenia is important as far as through Armenia, Russia projects power in South Caucasus. But if this is finished, then, frankly speaking, I don't see any reason why the U.S. should have any interest in Armenia. Yeah, it sounds like... For the U.S., actually, Armenia is just collateral damage in this area. Yeah, so this week, another poll by MPG was released, or the results of the poll by MPG. MPG is one of the main posters in Armenia. Uh, Benjamin, I wanted to see if you had uh, seen this poll, and we have some questions for you, however much we can get into uh, the amount of time that we have left. One specific question that's really interesting was the the first one, which is covering basically who is to blame for the Artsakh blockade. And the question was framed in who is responsible for the current conditions created due to the 200-day-old Artsakh blockade. And it seems that there is a significant shift from sentiment in uh, between in six months, basically between June and January 2023. For instance, in January, 30.2% blamed Russia. Meanwhile, in June, uh, that number dropped down to 25.2. So essentially, less people are blaming Russia, uh, less people are blaming the Azerbaijani government, and more people are blaming the Armenian government itself. Essentially, does this sound like uh, essentially fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me attitude? Is it possible that people are slowly coming to the realization that the Armenian government has some role, if not a major role, 
in uh, how the situation develops on the ground there? Probably yes. Probably people understand that at the end of the day, all this mess started after October 2022 when Armenia and Azerbaijan first declared the intention to recognize each other's territorial integrity within the 1981 uh, Almaty Declaration. And probably people understand that if Armenian government is telling that Nagorno-Karabakh is Azerbaijan, then it's very difficult to demand from anyone, US, France, Russia, India, China, I don't know, Greece, Cyprus, or anyone else, Iran, to say that no... Karabakh is not Azerbaijan, and we are going to have significant tensions with Azerbaijan because we believe that Karabakh is not Azerbaijan, while Karabakh is an Armenian land. So if Armenia is okay to recognize part of Armenian land as a territory of Azerbaijan, then I don't understand why anyone should not be happy. If that's the case, so far the Armenian government mostly has been appealing to other governments, world organizations, NGOs, blah, blah, blah. If that's the case, then what does the Armenian public expect the Armenian government to do? Essentially, basically not to announce that Atsakh is Azerbaijan, maybe? Is that is that the extent of it? Is there any data in this poll that could have given you a glimpse into what the Armenian people would prefer the Armenian government to do? It's very confusing because, for example, look, I believe another poll which was published, I believe, in late May, early June, this IRI poll. And it showed that the poll was conducted, I believe, in late March. 2023. Maybe I'm wrong. But the poll clearly stated that 77 0 percent of the population did not approve the uh, policy of Pashinyan in Nagorno-Karabakh. While after that, Pashinyan gave several press conferences clearly stating that I am going to do what I am going. Yes, maybe in uh, June 2021, our parliamentary elections, uh, like campaign promises, were a little bit naive or etc. But we are uh, going to push forward this peace agenda. But the problem is that Look, if we agree that 70% are against Pashinyan's policy in Nagorno-Karabakh, yes? Right. And 70% is quite a high number. But after, on May 14, Pashinyan and Ali have agreed to recognize each other's territorial integrity within numbers. Less than 86, 600 square kilometers of Azerbaijan and 29, 800 square kilometers of Armenia. And then Pashinyan reiterated this position, I believe, in press conference on May 22, stating that, yes, Ali recognizes Azerbaijani territorial integrity, including Nagorno-Karabakh. So if 70% are against this, then at least, I don't know, some 10,000 people should go to the street and protest. But we see that nothing happens. So I believe that uh, in, like uh, these simple sociological surveys are not providing the real picture. Because maybe some mm. people, like psychologically, they understand that you cannot say, I agree that Karabakh is Azerbaijan. Or at least they understand that they should not say this publicly because it's a bad thing, put it uh, in a very simplistic way. But maybe the fact that they don't tell public that Karabakh is Azerbaijan, or even they're publicly stating, no, we are against those who tell that Karabakh is Azerbaijan. But who knows? Maybe many, somewhere deep in their soul, think that, okay, maybe this is the only way to survive, to save Armenia. We're tired of this Karabakh. And let Azerbaijan and Turkey finish this and uh, allow us to enjoy our life. So, frankly speaking, I'm not very much sure about how, what majority of Armenian society feels. Yeah. Because it's other things to publicly state something, because you are under psychological pressures that, okay, you will be perceived as a traitor, I don't know, as a coward people, as a bad guy. But it's a completely different when you are inside this uh, voting booth, nobody hear you, nobody uh, listen you, and then uh, the election are being made not only based pure on brain, but also on heart, like on these emotional issues. But again, here is uh, our situation is very bad because, again, government is crossing red lines and nothing happens. So there's a, actually a, a related question to that that maybe we should talk about now. I was uh, planning on talking about it later, which is the potential for military action. And basically, it asks, how likely do you see an Azerbaijani military aggression against Armenia in the coming months? 36.5% said definitely likely. 40.4% said somewhat likely. So altogether, that's like 77% and more, more than 77% think that Azerbaijani aggression is imminent. I think that's a sober assessment of the geopolitical situation, but it still leaves a lot of questions for me. Like, why does the populace tolerate this leadership, which is not arming itself to the teeth militarily, preparing for this aggression? What are your thoughts on these results? I mean, we can go into the rabbit hole much deeper but at least we should try to scratch at the the surface a little bit you know more deeper okay again very interesting question and 
it's not only the population because look uh, if you uh, go to the popular traditional tv channels and internet tv channel let's assume there are 20 or 25 in armenia and every tv channel has one or two interviews per day yes so it's been like 50 yes. interviews per day and the minimum 50 percent of these 50 interviews are focused on armenia azerbaijan nagorno karabakh which means that 25 interview per day and from these 25 at least 24 are telling that yes azerbaijan is preparing ground to take nagorno karabakh by uh, disseminating these files a narrative of Nagorno-Karabakh army shooting against Azerbaijan or telling that there is no Nagorno-Karabakh defense army, these are Armenians armed units, so it means that Armenia violated this November 10th trilateral statement, blah, blah, blah. The interesting thing for me is that while almost everyone is sure that sooner or later Azerbaijan will launch a large scale attack against Nagorno-Karabakh, and given the number of population of Nagorno-Karabakh and number of population of Azerbaijan, and many other factors, we understand that in case of large scale attack, terrible things will happen. Terrible things is going to happen. But the problem is that everyone is telling, yes, terrible things is going to happen. Most probably Azerbaijan will attack Karabakh. There will be large-scale attacks. There will be many deaths. There will be damage, and etc., etc. But no one is telling, okay, let's see. Nobody's doing anything about this. it. Yes, uh, how to postpone this? Like, I don't believe that it's a normal strategy. Simply go to TV and say, okay, guys, maybe in uh, 15 days, Azerbaijan will attack. And then next day, okay, maybe in 14 days, Azerbaijan will attack. Okay, what does this give? Except putting more psychological pressure on people living in Nagorno-Karabakh. Because these people are not only deprived of the many basic food, medicine, and other necessary devices or uh, necessary tools, but also they live under terrible psychological pressure. Because when they are here, that every day experts with happy faces are telling, yes, most probably Azerbaijan will, will attack. Yes, Azerbaijan will attack, of course. Azerbaijan prepares ground for attack. But then question is, what is doing Armenia to prevent this attack? Because at the end of the day, let's not forget that these people living in Nagorno-Karabakh, they have Armenian passport, which means that this is a responsibility of Armenian government. And here is a very, very interesting question, because some may say, okay, but Karabakh was never part of Armenia, it was quasi-independent, or it was independent, but even Armenia did not recognize its independence. First, it's very bad. Armenia did not recognize independence of Nagorno-Karabakh, despite the fact that for example, before April 2016 war, Sir Sarkisan was telling that, okay, if there will be large-scale war, we will recognize independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. Maybe April 2016 was the right moment. But in any case, you cannot bring uh, the past back. Let's look to the future. And by looking to the future, something should be done, or at least people just should think who can prevent this attack coming. Neither than blame. For example, I'm hearing many statements that people are saying, oh, Azerbaijan is going to the ethnic cleansing, is terrible, Azerbaijan is bad uh, state, uh, President Aliyev is an authoritarian leader, and etc., etc., etc. And then people think that, okay, we did uh, many good things for Nagorno-Karabakh and bordering regions of Armenia. But no, something, someone, and first of all, state, because state has huge resources. State has tens of thousands of people who are working for state. Tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are working for state. So this, there is an enormous resource in state to think how we are going to prevent this Benjamin, on that note, as to who can help, there's another question in this poll that is very interesting. They ask, in case of military aggression, which countries could we expect military assistance from? And the answers are fairly interesting because six months ago, people were still saying things like France, Russia, Iran, America will come to help Armenia. All those numbers have dropped precipitously to 30 to 40 percent or less of the previous levels. Now the largest group of respondents say, Nobody will come to help. This is some serious sobering up. We're sometimes accusing the Armenian people of sleepwalking through the political times or in a deep slumber or depression since the 2020 war or whatever. But they're clearly aware of what's going on and their views have shifted accordingly. So where can these perceptions lead us? You were talking about maybe the unhappiness of the people, but there's going to be some kind of a consequence at the poll, I would imagine. Aspet, uh, uh, before uh, Benjamin answers, uh, I would like to interject and also try to pose another question that he can answer. Is it true that nobody will help us or is it our policy that has driven everyone away? For instance, you mentioned several times that why should Iran help if Armenia is saying Artsakh is Azerbaijan and why should Russia help? Uh, do you believe that there is anything that uh, Armenian policies makers could do, you know, that would change things? Absolutely, because we seem to be shooting ourselves in the foot here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's separate two issues. If you are speaking attack against Nagorno-Karabakh, definitely 
the Armenian statement that Karabakh is Azerbaijan, Armenian statement, official statement that Armenia is nothing to do with Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh. It's up to Russia. It's Russian responsibility to protect Nagorno-Karabakh. Of course, all these statements send clear message to anyone outside the world that even Armenia is somehow maybe was forced uh, due to the defeat in 2020 war, due to the trauma, due to, I don't know, for whatever reasons. But this is sent, uh, this uh, sends very wrong or even harmful messages to outside world that Armenia already has accepted the fact of loss of Nagorno-Karabakh. So if Armenia has accepted that fact, that why anybody should uh, have problems with Azerbaijan for the sake of Nagorno-Karabakh? So, And in fact, it is a policy. It's not just that Armenia has accepted the fact. Like through the mouthpieces of the Armenian government, day in and day out, you hear that, you know, hey, um, don't do anything or else, you know, don't go against this government or else there'll be war. So it's the policy of the Armenian government, essentially, to have this confusion among people and to make people believe, in my opinion, or is it the policy of this government? Let me rephrase it. Is it the policy of this Armenian government to make people believe that no one will come to their aid? Therefore, making me making it less likely for there to be any opposition. Okay, uh, frankly speaking, for expert or analyst, it's very difficult to rationally analyze the full foreign policy of Armenian government. But the one thing is uh, clear: when many are telling, I mean, foreigners, experts, diplomats are telling that, okay, guys, June twenty twenty one snap elections, they were proof that Armenians in Armenia, at least, they don't care about Artsakh. So they voted for the person who almost lost Artsakh, probably hoping that the protest will reach the end. And uh, here, the answer is very clear that, okay, but read, please, uh, please election program of civil contract parties. They were speaking about the occupation of Jushin and Tadrut, about remedial cessation, etc., etc., etc. And then you can say that, okay, guys, now what the current government is doing, it's a little bit opposite what it pro promised to do uh, immediately before June 2021 elections. But we also have mayoral elections, I believe, in September or October 2023. I mean, the elections of Yerevan mayor. But unfortunately, we do not elect a concrete person. We uh, vote for uh, some party, and then through the party list, some people will appear in this uh, Yerevan council. However, the problem is that now we will have elections, and now nobody can say that, okay, Pashinyan did not say that he's going to recognize or recognize Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. So I believe many wait for this also local Yerevan elections. Because if civil contract will win in Yerevan, and we know that de facto Yerevan is 50% of population. And for example, in June 2021, Pashinyan got more votes in regions than in Yerevan. So maybe it sounds a little bit strange, but I believe that for uh, external powers, if civil contract wins in bare elections in Yerevan, this will be another clear-cut message that a majority of Armenians are absolutely okay with Pashinyan's policy on Nagorno-Karabakh, which means that while, for example, in this IRI poll, while being asked, people are telling no, we against Pashinyan's policy, but then they are going and vote for Pashinyan people, which means that somewhere deep in their soul, maybe they are agree with Pashinyan policy. Yeah, you talked about the mayoral elections, and in fact, there is a question about this too in that poll. Essentially, it's asking which party would you vote for in the September uh, Yerevan City Council elections. The ruling party, with all of its administrative resources in full application, is barely getting 10% for its candidate, Tigran Avinyan, barely eking out Haik Marutian, who was kicked out of his position and the ruling party by Pashinyan two years ago. But we should not forget that Haik Marutian himself is... I believe there, there's rumors that he may be partnering up with David Sanasarian's political party, which is not that unfriendly with Pashinyan. So at least ideologically, they are close to civil contract. So we shouldn't forget that. But essentially, it's 10.1% for Tigran Avinyan, 8.2% for Haik Marutian or whatever group he leads, then 5.3% for Haya Sandashing and 4.5% for uh, the Re Republican Party. Altogether, you know, I think the winner here is apathy because 16% said nobody, 13% said they will not participate, and 30% are undecided. That's 59% uh, of all respondents altogether who are not committed to a candidate. On the surface, does it seem like a wide open race? Or do you believe, for instance, that uh, the uh, much talked about administrative resources will eventually kick in and help Pashinyan along in these elections as well. Frankly speaking, I'm not an uh, election expert to try to like anticipate the results. But what I am 
telling that if the civil contract will win in Yerevan election, this will be perceived by outside world. Another proof that yes, despite all these polls, somewhere deep in their souls, the majority of the population supports Pashinian policy on Nagorno-Karabakh. And the policy is that, sorry guys, but Armenia cannot support Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenia can only send money to Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh as far as Russia or anybody else is ready to provide for them security. If no, okay, Armenian government cannot do anything and will not do anything. So this will mm. perceive that the majority of population supports these lines. Yes, it's essentially another referendum on Pashinian's policies. Uh, some are, yes. I am telling that this will be perceived in outside world. Maybe people will go to the vote in Yerevan. They will vote based on, I don't know, garbage collection, based on the problems or solving problems in public transport, seeing new buses, new trolley buses, or not seeing, or whatever else. Maybe for many people, they even will not think about Karabakh while going to vote. But I'm just telling that for outside observers, the result of the vote will be also perceived as a, like somehow... Uh, confidence, what of confidence or what of non-confidence to government position on Nagorno-Karabakh? Well, there are a couple of other questions in the poll that we're not going to be able to cover during the show, but I think we're going to put them in our show notes for people who are interested. But one question is asking about Pashinyan's ideas of changing symbols and stuff like that. And 70 plus percent of the respondents said they do not support any of these things. And then the other question had something to do with the war testimony. And basically they said, what percentage of the people trust the testimony that Pashinyan gave in parliament? And again, 70 plus percent of the respondents said they do not trust. So there's a huge amount of coincidence in a number of these answers that indicate that a referendum on Pashinyan is very negative on his performance and his government. Parliamentary elections, I believe we will have in 2026, even though force majeure. But again, Yerevan is 50% of population of Armenia. Right. And in June 2021, I believe, government or prime minister, its results were higher or more positive for him in regions than in Yerevan, as far as I remember. I mean, June 2021, some parliamentary election. So let's see. Uh, speaking of referenda, I wanted to ask you about this recent uh, Hayak effort, uh, Benjamin. Uh, we are now in the second or third week of the Hayak petition process meant to criminalize the recognition of Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan and criminalize the minimization of the Armenian genocide. So far, about 15,000 signatures have been collected, and altogether, the group needs to collect 50,000, so 35,000 more for the first phase, which is to request that the parliament introduce a measure and vote on it. And if the parliament refuses, then 300,000 more signatures are needed to force a referendum. Do you believe that this process, the Hayat process itself, could be an, a positive referendum, essentially, on whether people, or, or uh, I guess a negative referendum of, of people rejecting Pashinyan's policies? And what are your thoughts altogether about this referendum? From my perspective, this situation has two points. Okay, from one point of view, everything is okay. More or less, we live in uh, democracy. Uh, the ultimate uh, tool of democracy is referendum or the will of people. So why not use this opportunity to introduce this bill to the parliament? But this also could have a negative side. And what is a negative side? I believe that most probably the organizers will be able to get the 50,000 votes. Of course, this will go to the parliament and will be rejected by whatever reasons. But then, according to the same constitution, to make it a referendum, you need 300,000 votes. Or 300,000 signatures, sorry. But here I am not sure that it's possible to get these 300,000 signatures for many reasons. I'm not going to go into the details. But the problem is that if organizers are able to gather 50,000 uh, signatures, send the bill into the parliament, and after rejection... Uh, start uh, to find another 250,000 people. Let's assume that within fixed time frames, they are not able to find these 250,000 additional signatures to organize a referendum. This also will uh, send a clear message to outside world, including Azerbaijan. The less than 300,000 people are really care about Artsakh. So, for this thing, I'm not sure that do we need these public figures to know that how many people care for Artsakh? Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, uh, for PR. It's nice. All social media are a lot of people with the certificates. I mean, both Facebook and Instagram. But again, yeah. what if that uh, the initiators are able to get 50,000 signatures, parliament rejects, and then they are not able to get 300,000? What message it will yeah. say to everyone? Yeah, it seems that the options for Armenia's opposition and those who care about Artsakh are limited. 
One is, uh, you know, people keep talking about there are no political solutions, but this group is offering a political solution. But you're I right. Will say that the risk I will say legal solution. My understanding is this is legal, legal solution, than yeah. political or political slash legal, legal slash political. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is a reminder to our listeners that if you're a citizen of Armenia and eligible to vote, please go and sign the citizens initiative, hayakve.am, H-A-Y-Q-V-A.am. All right. I'd like to wrap up our topics here. I'd like to ask each of you if there's been something on your mind this past week that you would like to talk about. Bovik, let's go with you first this week. What's on your mind? Yeah, I'm going to keep it on Hayakve. Uh, we've already seen various physical tactics by the civil contract and their supporters to physically hamper uh, this signature collection effort. For instance, uh, many of the municipalities would refuse to provide space, which they're required to by law for collection of signatures, uh, referring to their higher ups, essentially delaying the process. Uh, that eventually got that hurdle got crossed, but the organization lost uh, one week. The matter even reached to physical pressure today when unknown assailants today walked into the Martuni City Hall and tore up papers and harassed the Hayakve volunteers and trying to prevent this uh, signature gathering operation. But I want to talk about something more sinister and something that's very obvious to me when I watch the message on public TV. Whenever, for instance, you tune into Armenian public TV, which commands a majority of the Armenian, essentially, eyes and ears, because especially in the regions, that's the only thing you can see. The message is clearly that if you vote for this or if you sign this, then you are risking war. And essentially, they reason about this because Pashinyan said uh, Artsakh is Armenia and period. And that's why Aliyev uh, launched his war. I mean, it's so disgusting to me. And unfortunately, I have to name names because this weekend, Tatul Kalkopian was with Petros Ghazarian on their uh, so-called dialogue where they continued this. And it was like every two minutes, they kept hammering the same thing. You know, it's dangerous. Don't vote for this because it will bring us to war. Petros Ghazarian said, you know, if, you, if you're voting for this, then maybe, or at least the, the, one of the other public threads of messages was that if you vote for this, then your children should be the first to be sent to the front line or the, uh, the first to be uh, drafted. And, you know, this would be uh, less intim intimidating if uh, the government didn't act on these threats before, because we remember that previously uh, they made such threats in parliament and they actually sent, they instructed the MOD to recruit opposition members for these one month or three month uh, training uh, exercises. And Tatul Hakopian's uh, reasoning was, if you just care about punishing, then yes, this is a good, you know, but uh, this law is going to be ineffective anyway, uh, because uh, Pashinya is going to recognize Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan. And you're just spiteful uh, for passing this law, because then you would be just caring about punishing. And that's what the evil Armenian opposition cares about anyway. They want to come to power, because um, that's the only thing they care about. And they're using this high act process to raise attentions in order to do that. Uh, that's my summary of the messaging drilled into the Armenian public minds by the Armenian propaganda, by Petros Ghazarian, by Tatul Hakopian, to my greatest dismay, and by those who are in the employ of Armenian public TV and its auxiliary sources. Hovig, we should have given you an entire section, not just a 30-second rant. Benjamin, what's on your mind? Okay, what is in my mind, I believe the most problematic thing is that for many actors outside Armenia, unfortunately, Armenia as a state and Armenians as a people now perceive uh, like an actor who can be, let's try to use a more wild term, who can be offended non-stop, whose red lines can be crossed non-stop. And uh, this person, if we speak on personal level, like Armenia as a state and Armenia as a nation are perceived as a person who can be non-stop insulted whose all red lines can be violated, and he will do nothing, accepting this as a punishment of God or uh, whatever else. And this is the most dangerous thing, because if international community believes that Armenia has no red lines, or any red lines of Armenia can be easily violated, and nothing will happen, because Armenian nations will say, okay, don't care, uh, only thing which we need is uh, one more shower, mug, kebab, or coffee, and unfortunately, this perception is becoming more and more tangible and more and more prevailing outside Armenia. Uh, then I'm afraid we're completely doomed. 
a people with no red lines. Is that not also known as a people with no honor and no dignity? Something like this, yes. You put it in more like cruel terms. I try to use mild terms, but at the end of the day, yes. All right. We're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, Benjamin, for joining us today. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Aspet. Thank you, Hovik. It's always a pleasure. That's our show this week. We hope you found it useful. Please follow us on social media. We'll talk to you next week.